Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of the Be A Boss Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Beatriz Rivera, and I am an entrepreneur and business coach, founder of Be A Boss Coaching, a one-on-one program for women of color, BIPOC, and queer entrepreneurs. And today I have a special guest, Shara Ruffin. Shara is an independently licensed clinical social worker and former psychotherapist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She holds a bachelor's degree in social work from Lock Haven University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree in social work from Howard University School of Social Work. Shara has specializations in grief, personality disorders, family trauma, compassion fatigue, military counseling, mindfulness meditation, ADHD, and anxiety. Shara is a board-certified telemental health provider. She is also a 5 times Amazon bestseller of social work journal called The 90 Days of Prayer, and she is the author of her second best-selling social work journal, 90 Days of Inspiration, which is a study companion for social workers taking their licensing exams. Currently, Shara is the founder and CEO of a consulting company called Journey to Licensure, and her company combines wellness, clinical supervision, professional development coaching to support social workers through licensure examinations, and Journey to Licensure was featured in Business Insider, USA Today, and Success. Shara is also a LinkedIn advisor and was most recently awarded top 15 LinkedIn experts in Philadelphia in 2023. Journey to Licensure is a company dedicated to helping social workers reach their full potential in and out of the workplace. I'm more excited for Shara to speak more about her company, her entrepreneurship journey. Just a side note, this podcast was recorded in December 2023. I hope you enjoy. I have with me today, Shara Ruffin. And Shara, am I pronouncing your name right? Can you let me know? Yes, you are. (laughs) Awesome. Yes. Okay. Uh, So with me today, I have Shara Ruffin. She has over 18 years of experience in the social work field and is the founder of her business, Journey to Licensure. I'm really excited for you to share more about that journey, about your business, and we can go right into it. So if you can just let us know more about you, what your business does, and your business mission. Sure, I would love to. So hello, and to everyone else out there that's listening. So my name is Shara. It's, um, it was already formally announced. So I am a former therapist. I have a business called Journey to Licensure. Um, that's been a thriving coaching business for social workers for about three years. It'll be three years in January. Um, I can't believe it's been, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> gone fast. I remember when I said, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, I was very scared to do it and I decided to turn it into a business based off of a story that I shared on LinkedIn. Um, mm. It has taken off and it's getting bigger. So Dirty Licensure is a business that's focused on helping social workers uh, really focus on their personal development, their supervision. I'm a remote supervisor, but I also help social workers in terms of working on their mental health from a holistic perspective. And the core of my business is helping them with their licensing exams because I had a very hard time getting to my licensing exam. It took me about a decade when it only takes about two years <laughs> mm. to get licensed. So um, I have generalized anxiety disorder, ADHD, and a learning disorder. So testing was always very horrible. Um, so when I studied for my exam, the first time I took it many years ago, um, I missed it by about three points. That was what was called the master level licensing exam. I had my master's from Howard University. And I took the exam and bombed it by three points. Not bad bomb, but in my head, I felt like Mm -hmm. it was a bomb. Um, Gave up, took it over two years later and passed it. Um, One of the issues later on was that life kind of kicked in. I went through a a mostly distressed military marriage, got divorced, had two children. One passed away. That was a stillbirth. Um, Had another compromised child, Jaden, who... I was told he wouldn't live beyond his uh, one-year mark. He's now 10 next year. 
Um, he had a kidney abnormality that could have killed him. He had surgery and he was a pretty sick baby until he was about five years old. During that time, um, I went through a, a very stressful divorce, trying to rebuild my career and trying to figure out what was going to be the next steps for me, uh, working three hours away from home. Um, I didn't have a car, so unlike LA, <laughs> here, uh, you can probably get away without uh, needing a car for a while because the public transportation is pretty close. Um, but I, it was pretty hard because he would get sick and I had to come home. I worked at a very high stress job as a psychotherapist where I could be sure I'm a social worker that had it all together, but then five o'clock rolled around, I had a sick baby and I was really struggling mentally. Um, depression kind of set in for many years. So when it was time for me to sit for my clinical exam, which takes two years, it took me another six years uh, while managing single motherhood, working full time, managing responsibilities. Um, I really struggled with trying to figure out um, what my life was going to look like if this was all I was going to do. I love being a therapist, but some of the um, systems that I had to work in in a hospital setting left me very limited to what I could do. So um, I remember August 2019, my son, he's getting ready to go to kindergarten. I wanted to spend that time with him. Um, of course, this is right before the pandemic hit. And I decided I was going to take my exam. It took me nine years to get to getting approved from this thing. I take it. I miss it by two points. I am now devastated because of how much work it took me to even get to this point. That's up to really my whole entire career. Um, and I'm just flabbergasted. I announced to almost 30,000 people on LinkedIn, hey, I'm going to pass this thing. <laughs> when I fail it, and then I tell everybody, oh, no, I didn't pay. I missed it by such and such points. It's like telling a small stadium of people. And <laughs> looking back, I was, I was, I didn't know what to do. I was like, I'm going to take it over 90 days. So I, I resigned from my hospital job, found a less stressful job uh, working part-time while I figured out um, how I was going to pass this exam. I needed a low stress level um, job to get into. And March comes around. <laughs> I'm hearing things off and on about this pandemic situation or pending pandemic of people getting sick around the world. And I really didn't pay much attention to it until I hit Philly. And when that happened, Everything's at a standstill. I was supposed to take my exam again, and I couldn't. So I ended up um, losing that job a week before the pandemic started. I ended up being at home with three children, and I struggled for about eight months, depressed, playing Animal Crossing. Um, that was my favorite <laughs> favorite game. It was a booming game at that time. Um, I'm at the gamer, so I, I couldn't really do anything else, and. Besides gaming and taking care of my kids until August of that year, I was like, well, I'm going to try this thing again. Things are still hectic, but I'm going to go ahead and try. I ended up um, getting insurance again to get a psychiatrist, um, getting um, a therapist to help me through some of the mindset that I was really struggling with um, because I had a fear of failing again. Uh, but I did pass November 8th, 2020, exactly one year two days to the day uh, that I failed it. Um, and that was a very surreal moment for me. I announced it on LinkedIn. It, when I shared all the pieces that I struggled with to get me to that point of passing my exam, it hit about 100,000 views. At the time, I was like, oh my God, I've never had this many people look at this story. I'm skipping over some parts here, but just try to hit the major points that people responded to. Um. And I said, I wanted to hear help more social workers. And I thought I was going to go into private practice, but that's decided not to. I started opening a room on Clubhouse and I started coaching social workers how to pass their boards. People started passing it just for about five or six months. And I wasn't in private practice. I just really enjoyed it um, to help my colleagues do what I couldn't the first couple of times. And I was told by a coach of mine, I think him for giving me that talk. Um, he says, Shara, you're doing something that's working is quite different. I think you should turn this into a business. And the numbers he was talking about in terms of turning it into a business, like, no, my, my 
colleagues can't afford this or whatever. And he, he, the best advice he gave me was, this is more about you and how you value yourself than it is about the people that you're serving. Um, that conversation in 30 days, I made my first $10,000 in one month. Um, mm -hmm. That was exactly one month from talking to my publisher, Eric Reed, um, and me believing in myself. Six months later, I garnished 108 um, K in six months. Um, and then I ended up in Business Insider. <laughs> and then from there, things kind of skyrocketed in terms of my brand awareness, working with LinkedIn, being called now the top voice in social work or on LinkedIn, not at a billion users on the platform. I got that accolade this year, which was, I didn't expect it. Um, but I have worked pretty hard to get myself to this point. Um, so I get to celebrate with my friends and family, not even just the revenue part, but how many, how many colleagues have called me and said, I passed my exams. Thank you so much for, uh, giving me a support system. So I tell a lot of people that want to start businesses. It's never about the money starting out. The money will come if you're good at what you do, if you're consistent with it, and you really show that you care. The money will, you can make money. The issue that I face a lot with a lot of my colleagues that want to go into business and think they're going to make all this money is that they forget the reason why they're doing it in the first place. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at in my journey at this point, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to pivot. Uh, this is my third year ending about over a thousand social workers have passed through my programs, um, by myself and it's growing <laughs> because of right. TikTok. It's blowing up right now. So yeah, it's been pretty busy. Wow. Damn. Yeah. I don't even have any words. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that this is year was incredible. Pretty, that is yeah, so incredible. This, and that's not even the kicker. The kicker was getting in major publications this year that I didn't even expect. Um, Success Magazine and USA Today happened four weeks between each other um, yeah. in October. And I was like, what? Eh. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been quite a ride this year. In revenue, mm -hmm. we hit about 200000 Um, mm -hmm. So double the revenue from last year. So um and now we're trying to figure out how we can expand our self studies to help more colleagues pass their exam. So it's um, it's been a lot. It has. <laughs> I mean, just your story alone, with going through the licensing, not passing by a very low margin, right? I think that's always the worst part is when you are like mm. so close, and it just it's not. It's not, it doesn't get you through the finish line. I think that that's always the worst part too. Um, but I, I find it so inspiring that you you use your experience to build a business, to have built a business um, from from that experience and now wanting to to give that back and, and provide the confidence and and getting the idea of helping other colleagues to go for this exam and give them the inspiration because it's not just coaching, right? Like I know that you do mm -hmm. coaching with your with your mentees and people who go through this program with you, but it's you are the role model. Like you are a prime example of what's possible. Oh. Um, and so that is truly incredible. I I wanted to ask you, how did you come up with this idea of blending coaching with also having this end goal of licensing? And and you went through that. So, you know, like I, I think when it comes to business overall, we sometimes get so stuck in trying to come up with ideas for business and mm -hmm. what can we do? And yours just came so naturally, like just felt like it just it like did. was there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't. I, I, when I think about the last three years and when I decided I was going to start this thing, I never, when I say never, I never would have thought that this is what I would be doing. I thought I was going to be doing private practice. The interesting thing is that um, I've been told in my, in my niche in the exam world, um, there are tutors, which are, tutors are great. There are self-study programs, which are great too. 
but there's a gap in services for people that are like me, that have anxiety disorder, that are busy parents, that don't know how to study, um, that have never taken an exam, that really need someone to be there with them. Um, there's a gap. I've had clients that were blind. I've had clients, clients that were deaf. I've had clients that have TBIs. I've had clients that have ADHD like me. So I have a skill set in terms of being able to gauge um, and base a study program based on where that person is. Unlike a study program or tutoring where it's a one size fit all most of the time. So I'm able to tailor and meet the needs of that individual based on where they are. Even in a group setting, I can do that to a degree where it's more tailored to how they learn and giving them feedback based on their, their results. Um, so I was told that that's a little unorthodox in terms of how I do it. Most tutors are just, you know, they have a skill set, but it's in breaking down the exam questions. Um, but what about those that have dyslexia? You know, what about those that are bilingual? The, in my world, the regulatory board said there are three people that don't pass according to their um, licensing. It's people of color. Uh, of course, we know systemically there are barriers there when it comes to standardized testing educationally bilingual people that are, don't speak English as their first language and also people that are older test takers. So um, then when that test, that study came out uh, last August, it was a 10 year study, which I was a part of because I was testing um, during that time, four times. Um, there are a lot of people who I can think of that I've been able to tailor their studies and give them support when they feel like giving up. We had one client that she had taken the exam 11 times. When I met her, she was at number 10. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the licensing clinical exam, I, I remember when I first took it, and this was uh, maybe, this was like six years ago <laughs> when I, after I finished uh, my my degree, right? And I remember one of the first things that they said about the test was that it's not about learning the right answer. It's about knowing how to take the test. Okay. And immediately that was like, oh, okay. So I could, it's not really about memorization. Okay. It's, it's knowing how to take a test, which to me, I was like, well, what does that even mean? Like, how do you know? Like, and it's, it, and it, I'm just thinking back to when I was studying for it. There was like a, a workbook that I had bought, and I think I had got it from NASW, the NYC NASW at the time. And sometimes the answers would be like, there, would, there was the question. And then all the answers, like they all, they could all be right. Like essentially, yeah. they, it, all the answers could be right, right? Like there's no, there's really no right or wrong answer here. It's though, it's really more about reading the question and understanding exactly what the question is asking and what it's, it, what it wants and yeah. answering. And I was, and that gave me a, a lot of anxiety. So I can't even imagine someone who has a lot of like test taking anxiety, who has ADHD, yeah. like you said, TBIs, um, in other words, traumatic brain injuries. So like all of these uh, barriers that are there for simply getting your license, like there's more than to yeah. just getting your degree in social work, but then you actually have to get your license mm -hmm. um, to actually stay employed. So the fact that you are helping people get past that challenge and that barrier in a way that allows them to pursue their careers and continue their careers further and not be because when you get a job as a social worker they sometimes even if you're just starting off you need to get your license within six months and then you're now and if not you're no longer able to be employed by them um, that's another stressor. Um, I hear a lot of my colleagues a lot where, um, sometimes they would just take the exam without adequate preparation and having extra pressure. It doesn't help. <laughs> it makes it worse. It makes um, it worse. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of what you're saying is true. There are people that are Rolodex in my head of, of people on my, my own podcast, um, that I'm thinking of that can 
that have spoken to those disparities in test taking, um, even with the ASW exam in general, um, it's it's a book test. So mm -hmm. one of the things I'm always teaching my clients is leave yourself, leave your work out of it. Because mm -hmm. you have to remember that there are underlying causes that they're testing that have nothing to do, <laughs> nothing to do, not so much to do with your work, but how to apply theoretical concepts of where that client is in the VI. Um, but usually when they're able to make that connection, it's better. But also the structure, knowing how to study for how you learn, um, being able to have structure to it, being able to have someone take away the how and give you a structure to follow, well, that's flexible to your lifestyle schedule. I had one guy, he had six kids. He was a program director in New York. His life was exhausting to me. And <laughs> we would jump on a Zoom and after he would get off work and we, we hashed it out for a good 12 weeks. Um, and it was giving him, he said it was the structure and he needs someone to push him. Tutors, again, an hour. See you next, see you next time. I'm always asking my clients, what, what stresses do you have in your life right now that may increase or exacerbate your stress and impact your exam? And I said, it's going to be what happens leading up to the exam that matters more than the day of the exam. You know, how can we make sure you're getting enough rest, you're getting enough sleep? And coming from a holistic perspective, for me, it's more important than just the structure of the exam itself. And making sure that person has adequate coping skills. I remember I had a woman, she had really bad ADHD. She, she had missed her LCSW exam each time by one point. When I met her, she was on number three. And man, she is, we did her doing really well uh, throughout the whole process. She needed the structure. And I coached her last summer. And she, oh, I, I, I take a breath because <laughs> she was really struggling with her inattention. And she would hyper focus a lot. So she got a week or two out from her exam. I said, We're going to sit here <laughs> on a Sunday on my day off, and I'm going to pretend to be your test proctor. And we're going to go through the questions, but I'm going to say, Look at it once, look at it twice. Okay, move on. Because she would hyper focus too long because of her anxiety. Um, as we know with ADHD, um, anxiety is comorbidity, a sister diagnosis to it. So uh, we sat for five hours on a Sunday. My husband's like, What are you doing? I said, Shush it. Leave me alone, go away. Take kids, whatever. Because I knew she could do it, but her anxiety and her, her and how she was hyper focusing too long was getting to her. The following week, she passed on a third time her LC. Now she's out there. Oh, wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. And it so just it goes time. to show. <laughs> yeah. It's the time and like also your skills, right? As a social worker, <laughs> you're implementing a lot of social work skills into your own practice helping social workers get their license. Um, so that's incredible. Um, I do want to ask a little bit about your, your journey as a business owner, as an entrepreneur. Sure. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about as a social worker, would you say that the skills of a social worker are different from skills of an entrepreneur? or a business owner. And the second part of that question is, if so, how do you build those, those entrepreneurship skills? I know you've experienced a lot of growth in your business it, as it's mm -hmm. growing. And so I'm curious, like how you are managing your, your growth and your skill set, and not just like you have the skills of a social worker. So I'm wondering what entrepreneurship skills or challenges have come up for you and how you navigate that in this journey? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a big mouthful question. I know, um, but... <laughs> I think at this point, I mean, I'll start with the first part. You asked me about um, social work and being entrepreneur. I think for me, and being a former therapist, they go hand in hand with having emotional intelligence. Um, part of the biggest challenge for me in the beginning was getting over my mindset of what thinking only traditional social work roles because there's a big taboo about money um of course that social workers only make a certain amount of money and we are only in it for money it's so fixed and i had to get past that it's okay to be good great at what you do have a lifestyle that you want 
is still give. I mean, you can ask Brene Brown. She's worth a couple million dollars. So <laughs> she's a social worker. You know, it's such a stigma in our community to talk about money, to talk about what we deserve. Because in, in schools, we're trained to basically give and not receive. The other side to that is that we have bills to pay. And this was something that I had to really even teach my colleagues when they're like, oh, man, I don't know if I can afford to. They're like, well, can you afford not to? You've taken the exam a couple of different times. So you're actually wasting more time and missing more opportunities not doing it. So having that conversation around the mindset of money and valuing yourself to know that you're worth it. That was a conversation I had to have with myself when I first started. Because I used to charge, believe it or not, $25 for what I did in the beginning. Um, and then after six months, I had him social proof. Um, Eric Reed, I always talk about him. <laughs> um, he was my he was my rock for a minute, and he was my first coach and my publisher. He said, "I really need you to really increase your prices because what you do is is unique from just exam coaching alone. In combining your experience of being a therapist, you have a unique skill set." Um, that it's different than someone that's just a tutor. And it took me some time to get there of building up the confidence to charge. And that's something in social work, even going into entrepreneurship, is a mindset shift that has to be made um, to know that the skill that, that you have is worth someone paying for, that your skill set will help them get to their goal faster than if they were to do something else that may not work for them. And being able to know that you're not for everybody. I'm not for everybody. Some people don't need my services. I've had that happen. But being confident that sometimes you get lucky enough to get a few people that will come back. <laughs> I've had that happen too. It's like, oh, sure, I didn't learn my lesson. No, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, <laughs> knowing that, you know, you're worth it. That would be my first advice to any social worker that wants to go into entrepreneurship. Know that it's okay to want the things that you want, that you deserve more. Because whenever I, I was in the social work welfare conference, step, I don't know if you heard about the first social work welfare, not welfare, social, social work welfare conference uh, that was done a couple of weeks back. Um, uh, Oprah's um, other half, Stedman, I didn't know he was a social worker, had headlined that virtual conference and I was one of the master class speakers um talking about journey to licensure and, and building a six figure business that's growing from a story. And what a lot of the social service questions were, were asking me, well, how do you do that? And I said, um the how was really in the fact that I wasn't trying. I had a passion for wanting to help people that were like me. I have went through licensing for 10 years between two exams alone when most of my colleagues were just passing me by. And I, when I saw that post on LinkedIn that got all these views, I knew there were people out there that needed help. I just didn't know where to start. Um, but I did have some coaches along the way. I will say that I had a couple of uh, LinkedIn influencers give me really good advice about being consistent, being seen, giving value. And for six months, I did this one thing for free. And building up that type of social proof takes time. But when you do have it, people will pay for something that works. Right. So right. Uh, building up the proof and building the community around, it, I think it's vital. But in terms of the social work skills itself, I think they're easily transferable, all of them. Yeah. There's not one skill I can think of that it's not transferable when it comes to entrepreneurship. I actually think it enhances the all. <laughs> it enhances the role of being an entrepreneur, um, of knowing how human behavior works, of knowing how people view things and what they value. And looking beyond the dollar side, really holding the space for them and saying, hey, how can I meet you where you are? Um, how can I help you? You're calling me. And even if you're, the services don't really align, who can I point you in the right direction to give? How can I be a resource to you? Um, those things are vital, I think, in that role. But also knowing where you need to delegate. That's where I'm at my <laughs> in my journey. I'm now starting to hand off things because it's getting to be too much. <laughs> right. I would spend 10 to 14 hour days um, at my desk working, trying to help people pass. But knowing that I still have children. I have a 
a significant other. I have a ex family that I have to start delegating because um, I'm at a point in my journey where it is just floodgates have opened, which is I'm blessed to have. At the same time, I'm only one person. Right. Yeah. Which I mean, most I'm, people I'm... say is a good problem to have. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's a good problem, but it's still a problem. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Still a most problem. business owners are like, that's a good problem. It's like, it's only one me, not enough me. And they're like, oh, that's a very good problem to have. We can solve that. Yeah. But um, my dream is to is to really train other colleagues bring other people on board to train them how to, how to have a more holistic process um, to help. If I could in every state, I would. Um, because I can't, I know in my mission, I can't do this alone. For sure. So. I, yeah, I'm so glad that you said that. And the part around taking time to, to build that social proof and to build the, yeah. the relationships and the fact that you did this, you said you started charging $25. January, yep. JR 2021. <laughs> yes. $25 and, then, and, then and sometimes not at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You said for six months, right? Like you were just doing it. Six months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's, um, that's something that we hear, but it's sometimes hard to accept, right? Because it feels like, especially when we're in that mindset of trying to grow things and trying to like see things grow as fast as possible. Maybe not as fast as possible, but see some sort of of growth or tangible change in what we're trying to do as business owners mm-hmm. and um and having that patience to really and it may not even be six months. Sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes hey, it takes yeah. a year. Like sometimes it takes two years. I even myself, I started coaching back in 2022, 21. I don't even remember because it feels like a long time ago. And the growth is just now starting to take off. Like that growth is just starting to move. But in the beginning, sometimes it's, you know, it's hard and it's hard to see all the work that you put in and and then um, sometimes not see the way it changes your your business or grows your business but I'm glad that you said that like even it when takes- you are yeah and even when you do have clients you still have to do, build that trust you know it's not just mm-hmm. about getting the clients you have to build the trust with them so that they can essentially be ambassadors of of you and your business um, so I'm glad that you said yeah, that yeah the best and ad- the best um and I've had no paid no paid ads and never. yeah <laughs> not even for my book and people ask me well how did you do that like I had a book that came out my social journal it's the first one of its kind it went five-time Amazon bestseller within 24 hours um and I remember when it happened I was like huh but what happened was I had already built a community around it so brand awareness and being consistent is important a lot of people get overwhelmed when they're like I want a chance to say how you're everywhere I'm on seven different platforms on top of having a podcast that I've only had for nine months is about 151 episodes. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't understand. Um, But I have a team that helps me with that now. But when I started out, um, even before the business, I already had a a small, um, I would be called a micro influencer on LinkedIn at the time. It was like 30,000 people that were following me at the time. And that simply came from engaging with others' content. LinkedIn has changed over time. But to grow on that platform, engaging with others' content and being active is really a commitment. <laughs> um, and right. th- so when I actually had something to value to give, it blew up easily because the trust was already established. Mm-hmm. But it took about, what, 2018, 2019, <laughs> three years before that yeah. happened. Right. So I, when people ask me, they'll ask me all the time, like, oh, my gosh, sure, everything you touch is gold. It's like, no, this is. 18 years of being in the field and then it's another what I've been on social media um starting to share really in 2018 on yeah. LinkedIn and when I actually had a business then it, it kind of like I needed to shift gears a little bit but it took a while yeah the couple and of I, years yeah and I also want to point that your vulnerability was I feel like something that was key there too because 
like you mentioned sharing on LinkedIn, like I'm going to pass this thing and then that not happening. I remember I had a friend who was studying for the exam and told no one because she was afraid she would fail. Like she, and I was just like, oh, congratulations, <laughs> you know, just after <laughs> the fact, you know. But there's a lot of vulnerability there too. I think that in the in this journey that happens and that sometimes when it comes to risk, it's definitely difficult to get used oh, that's to huge. and get adjusted to. <laughs> yes. It is. And I want to go into huge. that. Like what are, what are some um, risks that you've seen in your business and and then if we can go into what are some failures. So I know that in business, you know, we love to share, especially on social media, we love to share our wins, right? Like, oh, this happened and this is. I've done, you know, I've I'm shared both. This. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that's what creates a lot of authenticity. And so, mm -hmm. um, and trust, right? Like trust from that this is, like, this is vulnerable and this is who you are. Mm -hmm. Have you experience a particular failure in your business and and like what came of it um really you know i'm human so not every person that you sign up coaching is going to be satisfied some people you've learned to kind of having to set boundaries with um it's hard when someone you put all your all to somebody and then they don't parent right uh, or they don't hit a specific goal um, and trying to really look at, well, what did I do wrong? How can I help this person? And I know if my clients, I stay with them until they pass um, their exams, um, especially if they really struggled or had a lot of life issues. Say, hey, you've already invested one. You're not investing again. We're done. You, whatever we need to do, you're just going to stay with me. And I've made that commitment. Usually when I get new clients come on, I'll say, I'll let them know, hey, from the gate, that this is an investment and we're going to make good on this investment as in if anything happens, you will not have to pay. That's it. I actually had a client like that. Uh, she's actually on my podcast. She got uh, had an unexpected complicated pregnancy in the middle of her study for an LCSW exam. She was really sick, like dangerously sick. And she had been in my group, my study group on Clubhouse for Ooh, I want to say a year or so. And she finally got the guts to come up and do coaching with me. Everything's going well. And then she gets sick and she ends up saying, I'm going to take the exam anyway. We were done coaching. I'm like, I don't know. And she had the baby. A few days later, she takes the exam and she fails it in double digits. Like, okay. And then that March, um, this was this year. She says, hey, Shari, I see you got a group program coming up. I really want to be a part of it, but I don't have the money. I said, that's fine. I told her, come on in. Um, and she came in and she passed her LCSW exam. Um, sometimes, at least for me, I never want to leave somebody without. And I'm a little bit of I've been, I have a type A personality. So there's this perfectionist piece. Like, I don't want everyone to let anybody else down, but. You're also remembering that you're human. Not everybody's going to be satisfied with everything you do. I've had instances like that. Um, and I've had to deal with it. But yeah. knowing that that comes with the, the good and bad sides of business. Um, and also knowing that if you do do very well. Trademark your name. Good. Yes, that's please it, say that it, again. That, she's, Jesus Christ, I've had, yes, I, I've had some interesting things happen. So um, that's, um, I can't talk too much about it, but what I will say and give an advice, you may not think that what you're doing has value, but when you start getting copycats, <laughs> mm. uh, all types of things, uh, made up accounts with your current testimonies on that you did not allow. <laughs> mm. Yeah, trademark everything. Um, I have a good trademark lawyer now. Thank you, Jesus. And we're taking care of that whole situation. But you want to make sure that you protect your work because you've worked right. hard. And, and there are people out there that will try to tear it apart, especially if it's something that's valuable and that it works. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like 
it's not a unique situation in business. Like it happens all the time, yeah. right? Like a product works mm -hmm. and then copycats come and they do something similar, call it something different. So mm -hmm. it, it happens all the time. It's not unique. And yes, so thank you for for saying trademarking because that is a big It is. It's one that I've learned a pain in the kind of a pain in the butt. I had somebody do something to me, take my name and try to drive traffic to it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no. And yeah. among other things. So it, you know, you don't think it's ever going to happen to you. But when it does, it's like, why are you surprised? So mm -hmm. yeah, just trademark licensing, um, especially if I decide to expand beyond where I'm at. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for I'm sure. I'm going to have to d d license that stuff. But in terms of a failure, I would probably have to say more for, for me is health. Um, this year and last year, I there were a lot of things that happened beyond seeing that I actually shared on LinkedIn. I lost my baby brother. He was 18 years old when he was killed last year. Um, he was shot and killed six blocks up the street from me. I was actually getting ready to do a study group live. And my mother calls me and says, hey, uh, we're headed to the hospital. Uh, that's where Samir is. I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, so I had to tell my, I had my best friend, Courtney, um, tell my students that, hey, she's not going to be on tonight. Where she came up, I get to the hospital and he was gone. Um, and then last, then six months later, my stepfather ended up with um, lung cancer and then brain cancer. And then my health tank where I ended up in the hospital for panic attacks and um, just, I, business was booming, but I wasn't doing so well. It was me throwing myself into work to deal with externally what was going on and it wasn't healthy at all. So if I were, I wouldn't say that would be much more of a failure, um, being in the hospital for the doctor to say, there's nothing wrong with you after eight hours. And you might be, you might, it might be more stress. Uh, you got to take better care of yourself. You need to do something different. Um, that is something to the core that I did share on LinkedIn and sharing, um, getting excruciating migraines, which I have always had them, but they were getting really, really bad. Um, to the point I was taking like three or four exaggerating per day just to get rid of them. Cat scan, nothing was found, but it was somatic manifested symptoms of stress. Right. Yeah. I mean that in general, right. I think, just the growth that you're experiencing in your business is stressful and then adding on top of that just life and not mm -hmm. just life but like loss and uh and grief you know that's oh yeah more than a double whammy so i i just want to acknowledge your bravery but i think it it gives us hope like it's there's still there's a lot of hardship that as humans we can go through and still know that we need to take care of ourselves as things continue to grow during those moments like what are what are some of the ways that you were able to balance or navigate like your business and then just like what are some ways that you took care of yourself during that time and then also if you were still working on your business or trying to keep that going like how did you manage that sometimes i can't even say i don't even really know <laughs> but i would say leaning on my friends um uh, because i have other friends that are entrepreneurs this year towards the end of this year is probably the first time that i've actually started really delegating um things and having two virtual assistants um there have been a godsend um having support with my other half he just, he deals with my shenanigans. Like last night, I was still at, on at midnight after doing um, a full day of back-to-back -back sessions and then hopping on TikTok for an hour to do a free session to help some colleagues out. Um, he was like, okay, you need to power down. You're going to be dead tomorrow. And yeah, he was right. <laughs> So, you know, and you're um, doing a podcast today. So. Yeah, I did. I did nine to three um, sessions, went out for lunch, 
uh, back to back sessions out for lunch and a podcast interview. And then I have uh, two, what one client, thank God. Um, I'll get a little bit of a break. I may just shut my eyes for a little bit. <laughs> and then I have a, my last podcast of the week. I mean, not podcast, my last um, uh, uh, TikTok session of the week. I do TikTok two to three times per week to give some support to colleagues. And I love doing it. So it's not like, oh my God, I have to do this. I generally, when I get to interact on TikTok to do live teaching sessions, I love doing I've been doing them for about a month. Um, about 12 social workers have passed from the live alone. Wow. So. Can you say a little yeah. bit more about that? TikTok, it's like different world, right? It I did is. not know that you could do, so you do live no, sessions yeah. on TikTok? Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. I use a huge board, it's, um, a huge electric board I have. It's called the Vibe Board. Um, some people have been seeing it on the internet, but it's it's huge. This one I think is like, looking at it, it has a AI camera. It's, it's like 50 inch. And I just basically put questions up, highlight, and teach. Um, and then I teach from, I have my cell phone up. I've only been doing it a month. I went from 20 to, no, a thousand people follow me on TikTok to now 19,000. Four weeks. Wow. Yeah. And wow. Um, and that's through doing the sessions on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. People are discovering me more. It's, it's compounded across all my platforms LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. People are now looking for me. It's like, oh my God, you got to come to check this lady out. I've gotten people popping up on all corners of social media about, yeah. I think I'm the only one that does the trainings. There are other social workers, but the do them the way I do them. Um, I do, uh, not a lot, 45 minutes. I try to help people out and they'll come back and say, oh my gosh, Shara, thank you so much, I passed. So it's, it's not about the money for me. It's just trying to help as many people as I can um, that yeah. need to help because there are a lot of things out there now compared mm -hmm. to what it was a decade ago when I started my journey. So if I can help somebody pass and just put up in the live, they're like, oh my God, I passed my exam, great. And yeah. I did something good today. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh. I do. I do want to shift gears a little bit into sure. a, a specifically right the, the challenges around testing. So, what would you say? And I think you you did say a little bit about you know systemic challenges and barriers that a lot of people face. That you know those those things are hard to account for when you're studying for for test, but. Um, are there any other specific challenges that you see when taking the licensing exam that are um, related to the, the test itself? Um, in terms of some of the, the barriers, well, they're supposed to change the constant exam in 2025. We'll see what happens with that. But um the systemic barriers, I think, have more to do historically with when it comes to people of color um, yeah. and the educational background that they have. Statistically, historically, they're not really in positions to be prepared for standardized testing. Um, it's just not there. The supports aren't there. Um, I came from a poor school district, um, public school district. I had did private school one year. And then my parents couldn't afford it anymore. But in that time, I saw how many kids were just at more advanced than me. And I was only in sixth grade at that time. And then going to high school and then going to college where I'm in a predominantly white school, um, college, uh, but being surrounded by people that have been in private school their whole life. And I'll never forget, my dad said, you probably, this is, I don't think you should have did honors. I think you should have went to write a program. And he literally said, I might not make it the first semester. I, I mean, the deans left the first semester. Um, but it, when I think about what my journey was coming from a poor district, poor background, not having the educational supports at the time. Yeah, I made it through, but that it was, it was, especially with undiagnosed ADHD at the time and undiagnosed anxiety for the first three years in college. Um, it was rough. It was constantly me sitting in my professor's office, costly, um, living in a bubble of anxiety and fear that I was going to fail. 
Um, it, but using the supports in the universities that were there, um, a lot of kids don't have that support or they're afraid to ask for it. There's a stigma, uh, you know that, around mental health, um, but even more so when it comes to academic, especially around um, a community that historically has had um, barriers around education and opportunity. Right. Yeah. I, I think that goes back to the way tests are created, right, in general. Like they don't take into account the these challenges, like these systemic challenges that we see. Um but in your work with with social workers and other people who really want to get over this hurdle, what would you say is a good indicator of how people know that they need support, like they need extra support? Because, you know, there's a lot of folks that are like, oh, let me try and do this by myself. You know, like I'm going to try. Yeah, and, they, and they do. Yeah, I think it, it depends on the person. I've had a lot of people come to me after taking the exam several times, I've also had people come to me that were fresh out of grad school. There's this kid named Derek. Um, he's on my podcast. Derek passed his master level exam 20 points over the margin, which is one of the highest passes scores I've ever seen. And he came to me straight. He's like, I don't know. I'm hearing all this stuff on the internet. People pass it all. He's like, no, I heard you were good. I'm going to go with you. And he's like, I've been watching you for a long time. <laughs> I don't want to fail. We're going to do this first time and be done with it. And he passed. So I think knowing yourself and what you know that you need. Are you someone that um, historically has had issue with standardized testing? Um, and I even had a lot of my colleagues when I would, when I would be in a consult with them, I would ask them about their academic history. I would ask them if there's like, well, how's your memory? Um, have you ever had testing anxiety? If you are a clinical, you're sitting for your clinical exam, how did you do with your master's license? How did you do with your bachelor? I would ask those questions because it gives me data or precursors about how they may do on their next exam, you know? And I think that's some of the assessment skills that come out when you think yeah. so. <laughs> right. You know, those are, when it comes to learning, um, you have to know yourself. Are you someone that can do well in a group? Um, mm -hmm. some people mm -hmm. want to try trial by fire. Let me do this by myself. I've yeah. had people do it and, uh, not do so well. I've had some people I know do it and they didn't need any help. So I think it comes down to what type of learner you are. Um, what's the best way that you thrive when it comes to a learning environment? Are you someone that really needs that nurturing? Are you someone that need, really needs that structure? Um, and that's kind of what I provide. I provide a lot of the nurturing. I've had my clients. Um, I had one uh, lady last week on my podcast. <laughs> I can't call her my pain in the butt. Uh, stepchild. Mm -hmm. Because um, she passed her LCSW. But boy, she was calling me late into the night. I'm struggling. Someone else didn't pass their exam. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Just go. a lot of mindset coaching. So with me, at least. I provide a safe space where my colleagues have my direct number. Now, I don't pick up. I was like, I'm sleeping. But they say, you can call me, you know, yeah. if you need someone to kind of talk through that mindset. Um, my colleagues would call me and I would talk, talk it through with them, whether they're in my membership community, whether they're in my study group. But sometimes they'll text me um, and say, I'm struggling here. I feel like I'm going to fail because there's a lot of cognitive distortions that come out, especially catastrophizing. Right. And really trying to help them get into a mindset to know that they can pass. Um, I mean, that's kind of the support that I provide because it's what I do all day. So it's like own clock coaching support. But I really think it comes down to knowing yourself. I don't think there's like one thing that, you know, if you know that you have a memory issue, you're like, oh, man, I have a memory issue. I may not do well. Um, those are questions I think everyone needs to ask them. What type of learner are you? Can you be in a group? Can you do a self-study program? Did you, could you, can you pick up a book and study guide and comprehend it? Take a practice exam, see how you do with it. You know, I, those are questions that I ask people, even people that contact me now, they're too close to testing. And I'm like, hey, did you take a practice exam? Take a practice exam so we could take a look and see if what you're using is working. Um, that's why I usually have people do the consultations because not everyone needs my service. They may need a little a bit of guidance. You know, right. hey, I'm using... YouTube, I'm using self-study, I'm using a popular study guide. 
um, but what I'm finding some of the disparities in the social work exams is there's so much misinformation out there about what the exams are, what they contain, and where do you go to get the right information? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of what I talk about the most. There's an ASWB guidebook that they can Google. There are two different ones that come up from the people that actually write the exams. They have the KSAs, the content outline. There's so many social workers on TikTok that was like, oh my God, I didn't know this was there. Study guides mm-hmm. are great if you can read them. Um, but I always play people first to say, go get the ASWB guidebook. It's on right. 2023 and 2024. Look at those because that, if you're going to look for structure of how the exam is written, how the questions are worded, go to the people that actually write it. There's a right. lot of marketing schemes when people put ASWB on study guides and think that, oh, it's ASWB. It's not. Mm-hmm. So I'm always trying to just educate people. Pick up the Google ASWB guidebook, 2023 and 2024. Um, look the, those over first. They'll give you the outline. It won't give, necessarily give you like the theories in detail. It'll tell you mm-hmm. what they're testing in general for yeah. each exam and how much and the percentage for each content area. So right. I think that's the bigger challenge besides knowing your learning style, not par- falling into marketing trends. What's popular may not be what's for you. I've always mm-hmm. had people come to me, they're using a popular program. They're like, oh, my friend passed it. Well, your friend is not you, you know? Right. Yeah. So just really, you kind of got me on a roll when I start. <laughs> and you're I'm passionate like, about are lighting it. These are some of the pain points that I hit. I mean, all the consultations that I do, I do like 15 to 20 of them a week. And I'm just like, it's the same <laughs> pain points. And then like, <laughs> guys. So I'll get on TikTok, like, these are all things do not do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. That's incredible. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Like, that was a lot for us to, like, really learn from you and to other social workers out there who are in that stage of wanting to pass their exams. Like, you have a resource here, so please make sure you contact Shara. So Shara, before we wrap up, I'd like to just get your information. Like where can people find you? How can people get in touch with you and stay connected to you? And I will share this information in the show notes, but just so that if people are eager and they can rush to you, <laughs> oh, where yes, can people you can. find you? Feel free. Um, wherever social media platform you live. So you can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook. I have a personal and business account. Um, TikTok is a business account. LinkedIn, I have a personal and company page. Yeah. I have seven different, and I also have a podcast. Journey Licensure, my company has a podcast that you can listen to as well. I've also had people pass from the podcast alone. So, uh, tell people that kind of check those out just to even stay inspired there's so many inspiring stories of incredible social workers who not only have used my services but their stories and how they persevered is gold because those are stories you don't hear you may have hear hey so i passed well what was your journey and that's what that podcast really provides yeah i i think it's always so helpful to just hear other people's like even not everyone's journey is the same, right? But I just think it always, uh, it gives us inspiration to continue, even when you do fail, even when you have to do it again, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and it's not easy. I think we tend to beat ourselves up when we we don't pass or when we don't do the necessary thing that we need to do to get our career moving and going forward. So I want to oh, thank yeah. you. No problem. Thanks for having me on. Yes, I I had so much fun learning about you, learning more about you. It's really interesting how we got connected just because I honestly like got an email from your, I think your podcast manager. Mm-hmm. And I was like, who is this? <laughs> they find me. <laughs> I was so, I was like, <laughs> but it was really interesting. Um just to get that email and to be like, oh, this is awesome. Like, and to get to know more about you and, and your journey and your story. So thank you for sharing 
your story with us and for sharing your tips and advice and uh, doing what you do, helping people pass their exams. Um, oh, is there anything you so that you'd like to share before we, we wrap up? No, I feel like my ADHD mind and my, my brain it was working at two different speeds. So I am, I'm, I think I'm good. <laughs> but I hope everyone listening, at least for my story, I just, you know, I hope they just find hope, especially my colleagues to know that there is something beyond the, the walls of your offices. Um, and what I mean by that is I remember knowing that beyond the paperwork, um, I'd be tired and exhausted. There's something else beyond these, the walls of the hospital I worked at. I was like, I don't know what it is, but if you have a, you have a gift and a knack beyond, and it's not the wrong with serving the clients that you do, but think bigger than just traditional social work. Nothing wrong with traditional social work. Love it to death. I'm just not in it no more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank I, you. I have, I have hung it up. Um, but it's, you know, now it's like I'm giving my wisdom to all my colleagues that are still out there. But uh, I want my colleagues to be able to have the choice to choose. And what I mean by that is I'm not a, at a point in my journey where I turn down six-figure jobs because I don't want them. Because I'm like, oh, I make this on my own. I don't, you know, I, I'm good. Uh, and not at, not all my colleagues have that choice. I want them to have that choice um, to be able to be for them to be well positioned, no matter where their what their gift is, no matter what level of social worker they're in, micro, mezzo, or macro, to be able to be armed with the gifts and be able to, if I want to walk away from this and turn my dreams into something else, no, no, that they can. Yeah, yeah, so true. I I think I might come to you later. <laughs> I, get my, I have my LMSW. It's in New York, and I let it lapse. It's practically not active. Um, yeah, and you're that's in okay. California, so yeah. Oh, Lord, so, Jesus. like, if I wanted like to, to get a whole nother, you can I'm take gonna have to ethics, talk to you about that. <laughs> ethics exam, ethics and law exam, right? Oh. And that that's a challenge in itself. That's a barrier for me, to be honest. But I don't need my license to start my business. But I have my coaching skills and my social work degree and experience and as a business owner that's my passion I love business and to pursue your passion through business and make an impact so I yes but don't just make an impact but go get that little time back you know? <laughs> <laughs> I get hey I love going to that store I did it that's it's, what I'm saying I, I might need to come to you to get my license so I can be like <laughs> I, I'm also I'm about to go in back York in there. California. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're okay. Yeah, girl. I'm about to go. I said, I'm, I'm about to go get my second bag next month. Ooh. No problems. Celebrate. I brought one for my birthday. Yes. I, this, yeah, this year was like really good. Thank God. I walked through this year unscathed and I mean, I'm going to celebrate with my family and a little Christmas that we're having celebrating. Yes, Christmas, but all of my accomplishments I have had. Along with my brother, he is finishing up his first semester at Columbia University. He is the first mm -hmm. first person in my family that he'll graduate by a degree. Well, congratulations. Which is a big him. deal. So it's a big deal. I am very excited to celebrate him. Celebrate me. Yeah. And have some good wine and stuff. I'm excited. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Shara. This has been an incredible talk and a pleasure to get to know you so i hope that we can continue to get to know each other more and uh if you ever want to come back to be a boss coach <laughs> podcast i'd love to have you come back um, and share more of how your story has grown and, and your business as well thank you for listening to the be a boss coaching podcast remember to come on over to the be a boss coaching.com and book your free discovery call where you can learn more about coaching with me, what it takes to start a business and grow the skills while growing your business at the same time. I'm excited to learn more from you. Remember to sign up to our newsletter and come back every Monday and Friday for new episodes.